right? Yeah. Perfect. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you once again for, for coming for one of our um, press forums that we're currently having. Um, it's been a very hectic um, last week, um, a very hectic week. Um, we're excited to update the nation on what has been happening um, in terms of the economy, in terms of politics and the way forward. Um, you're all welcome and once again thank you very much um, for, for coming to our press forum. Um, we will be starting now um, and um, L the LCCC will take over and then after that we will take a few questions if you have any and then we will conclude. Once again, thank you very much. You're all welcome. Thank you, Leader Sade and uh, plenty of colleagues for, for having come. Um, welcome to our premises that we um, will be operating from for the next couple of months. Uh, we, we hope that eventually it will become our own private property. But this day is for us a day as part of the celebration of the Week of Gratitude of LPM that we want to acknowledge, thank and appreciate the voters, supporters and sympathizers, whether they are in the rural remote areas of the country or whether they are in urban areas, whether they are young people or old, whether they are on Facebook or uh, listening to us on the radio, we wish to thank them for their support political support, support for advice that they have given us. I want to reassure them with the rest of the nation that the commitment that the Landless People's Movement Party has towards serving the interests of the people at all times. While I make that very clear that our commitment to the people is untainted, unhindered, we must also underline that a commitment to serve the people of this country under very difficult circumstances is not an easy commitment. The commitment to serve the people of Namibia comes with a commitment to be hard, to be tough, to be robust, and not to stand down amidst the enemy that consistently fights back. For this enemy has the tools, the instruments, the resources to launch a battle with the LPM. We have always maintained that the Swapo Party has become an anti-Namibian organization that neither is interested in serving the interests of the people of this country nor the well-being of the future of this country. As our view has been that the present has been strangled and the future of this country has been aborted by 30 years of Swapo Party's mismanagement of the resources and the trust that they have been given by the people for that period. In this regard, we have always, as we go to Parliament, been be co consciously aware that we go first to a corrupt parliament and secondly, we will be meeting, sitting and engaging with people who have benefited from corruption throughout the past 30 years. In this regard, therefore, the battle that we are facing as LPM is not an easy one. It is a battle that is in the public space. It is a battle that requires us to be strong, determined, and is a battle that requires us to remain focused on the end goal of ultimately removing Swapo Party from the government of Republic of Namibia. It isn't easy because from time to time they invent at the face of defeat terminologies to try to demobilize our supporters, to try to make us look as the unwanted to try to place themselves as the victims in the political space of this country. And the latest attempt they have made is to generate through newspapers such as the Informante the principle of disrespect and have labeled to the National Assembly their house of disrespect through an article written by Chris Jacobi. Of course, that Chris Jacobi himself today must speak of the National Assembly as the house of disrespect, given his history, is quite interesting. I want to say this to our supporters and sympathizers who from time to time become sensitive and perhaps a little bit worried about what they perceive as part of the propaganda machinery as LPM becoming wayward. 
those that have obtained the votes, the trust of the people of this country, that have therefore enriched themselves through positions of responsibility and have enriched their families throughout the past 30 years, are the ultimate individuals and the political party SWAPO that disrespect the people of this country. Those that have betrayed the trust of people and have not been honest with the future of this country are the ones that disrespect our people. Those who have left 67,000 graduates on the street without employment are the ones that disrespect our people daily. Those who benefit from corruption and defend corruption are the ones that disrespect our people. Those that refuse to correct their wrongs are the ones that disrespect our people. It is not the ones who stand up to point out corruption that are disrespectful. It is not the ones that stand up and speak hard and speak loud that are disrespectful. It is the defenders, the promoters, and the benefactors of corruption that refuse to correct their past 30-year attitude and approach to government and state institutions and the resources that must be blamed for disrespect. And so, as we have experienced in the first two weeks of Parliament, we have seen the following. That some newspapers are being deployed in an attempt to weaken us as unruly, disrespectful, and uh, uh, unprincipled individuals. That they have gone to lawyers to try to paint us as criminal elements has become evident. At the same time, while they are propagating this narrative, it has become clear that the fish rot corruption continues to linger in their hearts and in their minds. It has also become clear that they do not have answers to get rid of the endemic cancer of corruption from this country. And therefore, our fight continues. It has to continue. We have not come to the parliament, to the National Assembly in particular at this juncture, to play nice politics defined by SWAPO within its own rules. We have not come to the National Assembly to be good boys and girls that must behave because the elders of SWAPO say so. We have come on our mandate to execute a political and historic responsibility and at responsibility. Words will be uttered. Conduct will be uttered that may not that may not sound good, that may look rude, but no has been a neat affair. No revolution has been a church choir. No revolution has been a hallelujah amen. It has the tough, the ugly, grinding, hard work of men and women committed to see the end of the tyranny that has resulted in the total victory. For the past 30 years, SWAPO has been used to drive and create the narrative how opposition parties must behave opposition party leaders must speak, when they must speak, on what issues they must speak. to determine when these people will be silent, how they will be silenced. They have been the ones to determine how they can offer benefits to some opposition leaders in order to co-opt them into their fray. For LPM, how we speak is determined by us. When we speak is on our own choosing. Where we speak is the place of our choice. And in this instance, National Assembly is the terrain where we must speak 
every day and how we address specific individuals who choose to address us in particular ways is the final responsibility of us to make a judgment on. Mandela, when interviewed by, by Ted Koppel back in the 90s, said the following, and I quote, our attitude toward others is determined by their attitude toward us. Hmm. End of quote. If those ministers and members of parliament of Swapo Party portray a particular negative attitude toward what we stand for, toward what we are articulating in parliament, we too certainly and justifiably so, have the right to portray an exact attitude toward those individuals, if not more. At the face of continued insults, continued humiliation of the leadership of LPM as represented in National Assembly, we will respond with the same harshness and do so repeatedly to ensure that the message gets through, that the country is sick and tired of swap, and that we are not the small boys and girls that must become co-opted under Swapo's wings and behave like the Swapo Party Youth League to do and say as they please. That point must be very clear. We are on a historic mission. This mission, we have not killed anybody. We have not bombed any house. We have not destroyed any lives. We have not undermined any not impoverished any individual. We have not stolen from Namibian society. All we have done is to stand up for what we believe is right, speak what we know is what our constituents want to hear in the broader country, and remain focused on the variables necessary to make ourselves a successful political party. There are those who speak about my anger issues. May I say at this point, I don't have anger issues. I am a very happy, jovial individual who loves to love, who is passionate about the core values intrinsic to me and to the party I lead. I have no anger issues except that I have what they call in the Bible righteous anger and I encourage many Namibians to join us in righteous anger. Righteous anger has to do with individuals that stand up for injustices in society, fight those injustices, that stand up for the poor, the disempowered, the excluded. Righteous anger has to join us in righteous anger. But to conclude that I have anger issues is wrong. I don't have. I am happily married, father of children, leader of people, including older people. And from time to time, they advise us and correct us. They give us input. They reprimand us as members, as supporters, and we listen to them. When Utoni stands up, my very, very good friend, and insults us as being tribalists, and tells us that we are sick in our minds, when he stands up and says that we are suffering from inferior conflict, con con uh, 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 complex, Surely, as he is entertaining himself, we reserve the right to also tickle him from time to time and to tickle him in a way in which he tickles us. Sometimes in being tickled, he gets out of line and he runs to lawyers. But as far as the legal question is concerned, I have consulted my lawyers. My lawyers and I are waiting not anxiously, happily, for the defamation case to be made in a court of law. 
we are waiting. The lawyer that wrote things about me that apparently I'm a common criminal, we know things about that lawyer. We have done our study about that lawyer. I will be emailing some things to that lawyer about him having appeared <laughs> in a court there in Swagopmund on a number of other things. We are waiting for them to come. But what we always tell people is, if you start to pick a fight with LPM, make sure you have the energy to fight till the sun sets. Because once the sun sets, we are ready again for you. When a lawyer starts to behave like a politician in an ordinary letter that he writes on behalf of his client, we have conclusions to draw. When a lawyer starts to label a client or on behalf of a client another person as if that lawyer himself has a personal hate for the for, 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 for the other party. We take note of that. I am myself a lawyer and I know precisely how you write letters and how you don't write letters. I'm told this so-called lawyer is apparently a bulldog. Uh, my friend, I'm shocked that you're a bulldog. I thought you would be something better and bigger. Because a bulldog is very small. A very, very small animal. Uh, and I've also not asked the age of this so-called bulldog. Because some bulldogs don't have teeth anymore. Uh, so uh, we are happily waiting for that case. We have, of course, also said to the speaker, if it is customary now that members of parliament, while they have internal processes for parliamentary discipline and parliamentary uh, rules to be applied on, 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 on themselves, and they choose to seek solutions outside parliamentary processes, then surely all of us will seek those solutions outside parliamentary processes. Because there is the rules and, uh, and then privileges committees, standing committees, that deal with these matters. This internal procedure of parliament deals with these matters. Now, you sit there, you respond every time, every time when yeah, every time when somebody says something funny to you, you respond. You also return the favor. But you seem not to be able to sustain it and you run to courts. Then what are you doing in parliament and in politics itself? Because who says politics is a game of friends? It's a game of thrones. If you have watched that film, Game of Thrones, it's a toss and tussle. In fact, the Americans say politics is a contact sport. From time to time, you bump onto each other. You step on each other's toes. But if you have no skin left, because maybe you have been too long in politics and your skin has become thinner and thinner, as it shouldn't be, because your skin must become thicker and thicker, then you must get out of politics and stay home. Parliament, National Assembly, is not a preserve for Swarpwe to claim to cry like a small child and cry tears when someone says something to me. No. It is a place of robust debate, robust engagement, and agreement, and sometimes disagreement. But that is parliament. I must say to those that are worried about uh, the conduct in parliament, welcome to Politics 101. This is what parliament should be alive, engaging, focused on the issues, passionate at times, but at the end of the day, serving the interests of our country. So that is one issue. The second issue I want to speak about today is to give a bit of a reflection on the week that was, to quote an NBC program that was closed, after people became critical, and to first start with the budget. The budget tabled by the Honorable Ipumbu Shimi, we must know, is firstly merely an estimate, 
a budget is never an amount that already exists somewhere stored in a cupboard and they just pick the money. A budget is an estimate that requires the government still to go collect the amount of money and to finance ministries and offices and agencies. The budget that he presented, therefore, is a budget that does not push this country's development at the forefront. In fact, it is so bad that the development budget amount is only 6.5 billion, whereas salaries actually exceeds 35 billion. This gives us an indication that this country, in terms of job creation, in terms of infrastructure development, will not move forward in this current financial year and is projected also not to move forward in the next financial year. What we have seen from the Shimi budget is a crisis budget that does not without jobs for many years. It is a budget that will not build on the need to strengthen our skills, capacity and the resourcefulness of our young people. It is a budget that does not strongly focus on agriculture and therefore will continue to push our people, particularly in the agricultural sector, into greater degree of poverty. It is a budget that is based on new liberal tendencies that lacks a political vision and has no strategic development vision going forward. In other words, the Shimi budget is more of the same for the past 30 years as we've experienced it. We are therefore worried that the budget also has a budget deficit in excess of 15 billion Namibian dollars. What worries us even further, ladies and gentlemen, is that Namibia has begun to be trapped in the exact same African formula, where the country's economic capacity and resources have been destroyed by corruption, and after the resources are completely destroyed, that are supposed to create jobs, that are supposed to create prosperity, African governments have turned to the pension funds of workers. In Namibia, GIPF is now the prime target that will be funding budget deficits. Initially, they have said that pension funds must keep at least 30% of their unlisted investment portfolios inside the country. That amount went up to 35%, went to 40%, now stands at 45%. We are told that in order to finance the budget deficit, the government of the Republic of Namibia intends to push up that amount, that percentage, to 55% of unlisted investment to be held in this country in order to allow this government to take hold of pension funds and to finance a budget deficit. A budget deficit, in short, means the amount of money that after you have projected what you will collect is still left for you to go and obtain somewhere else. That somewhere else to finance the excess of 15 billion is now GIPA. The question now comes. This year they want to take a number of billions from the pension fund. GIPF is about 120 billion. Next year, they will take another number of billions. The issue here is, when you take from the GIPF, how are you going to repay GIPF? That is one. Secondly, when people go on retirement, in the next five years or so, you are likely going to see that GIPF will start to say, if this trend goes on, that they do not have money to pay out pensions. It is a scary affair that Swapo Party is busy with. When they are eating up savings of the working class Namibians, the public, the civil servants. And therefore today from LPM head offices in Ventu, we issue a stern warning but also an alert to the civil servants of the Republic of Namibia. Your lives, your pensions, the savings of, of hard work that you have made for. We are going the route of Zimbabwe. 
We are going the route of Zambia. Your pensions are under the biggest threat by Swapo Party. Your monies are being eaten up. And your monies will not come back as they should have. Because once your monies are taken out from GIPF, all that the money will do is to finance consumption. Consumption in the payment of salaries for yourselves. So every month, think about this. Think about this for a while, people of Namibia. Think about it. Every month, when you get paid, when you get a salary, you are actually beginning to be paid from the future amount that you would have benefited from. You are eating from your future while you think you are saving up for your future. It is scary. It is dangerous. And this is where Swabo Party has brought us. When last night the Deputy Prime Minister was speaking about the trust, the confidence that the people of Namibia have bestowed upon them, she knew that they have misused their trust. But the Deputy Prime Minister, as well as the Prime Minister, suffer from what Franz Fanon has called, and some of our colleagues like that vocabulary, cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance means that you see something you do not agree with, that you do not want to see. You see a fact that is true that you can't dispute. You have no other alternative facts but that truth, and you have to confront that truth. Cognitive dissonance says you avoid it. You decide that it is a lie, and you move away from that. Today, you can see that the entire Swapo Party government suffers from cognitive dissonance. They have destroyed the future of your children, but now they are coming for you and your pensions. They are coming for you and your pensions. Whether you work at NBC, whether you work at Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Ambassador, whether you are a young person that started working in government in the next five to 10 years, you will get the experiences of Zaire, where the government would take three to four months to pay you the salary of January, where the president, Mobutu Seseseko, when they would draft the budget, would be asked by his advisors, President, why don't you loan us from your money? And Mobutu would say, no, 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 Zaire is too poor. They cannot pay me back. We are getting to that point. Cognitive dissonance. GIPF monies, pension funds, they are gone. They are eating it up. They are finishing it. And we are going to follow it up with a letter to President Gottfried Hage Kengop, who now is also called Moses. The problem of Moses, really, is that he let people for 40 years in a desert. He could have gone just across from Egypt to Israel in a very short period of time. How many days? Seven. seven days. This is a pastor almost. In seven days, of course, it's just not a Moses problem. It was also the Israelites that wanted to, uh, they were confused, they had problems, they wanted to go back to Israel, uh, to Egypt, and say it was better under Pharaoh than to the promised land. That the problem is, Moses became old and God was merciful to Moses and said, come, Look across the mountain and see the promised land. But you, Moses, you will not enter the promised land. He died an old man. Joshua is the one that took them across. That is my battle for that. Amen. Took them across and gave all the nations of Israel land. Now, Moses Kengo, as the presidential affairs minister called him, when you take that narrative, we are in a dangerous zone. Why am I saying this? Remember along the way to Israel, the people became hungry. Suddenly you know that story. They became hungry. And Moses had to pray for a miracle. And the manna started to fall from heaven. 
We are not in that space where manna will fall to fund a budget deficit, Papa. We are not. It's real money, real people, real pensions. And this Moses, I don't know whether he's close to God as the other Moses was. So there is no manna going to fall to help Namibians. We have to work this way out. And I'm saying this so that as Namibians you would also know that we have elections coming in November. What are you going to do after we give you all these facts? Are you going to vote the same political party to ruin your regional councils? Are you going to vote the same ruling party to ruin your local authorities? Are you going to vote these people and come to LPM at night and say, talk about this, they are doing this, please talk about that, and you go back and sing Swapo songs because you have a tender, you are driving a black Range Rover. Are you going to do that or are you going to stand up for your children and for their future? Moreover, we have seen that the finance ministry is creating a new institution, Namibia Revenue Agency, that they do not need to create now. They will spend a little over 210 million for this financial year and we have said, don't do that spending, give it to the young people, to the SMEs. They have come back to Parliament Friday and said they are going to make that institution a reality. It is strange that they are going to proceed with this plan of NAMRA. Because in 2008, at their own uh, or, or voluntary basis, they commissioned a study to find out whether the creation of revenue agencies really improves revenue collection. Their own people went to Lesotho. They studied the model of Lesotho. They were told that in Lesotho, and in, as it is in other parts of the world, once you create a parastatal called a revenue agency, only the first year or so do you see more revenue collections. But it doesn't do any wonders in terms of additional revenue collection. And they were told that Inland Revenue Directorate, as it is now, already operates in an autom autonomous fashion that you would not require to create a parastatal. There were just four steps needed to make the Inland, Re Inland Revenue Division a directorate much more robust, much more strong in terms of capacity to do a, bet a better job. Only four steps. They completely abandon that own recommendation internally and go and want now to create a loan standing parastatal called Namibia Revenue Agency. Despite the better advice given to them by their own internal experts and they tell us that it's a necessity to enhance revenue collection. Cognitive dissonance. You know what you are doing is wrong. You continue to do it. Even last night, I felt so sad for the Honorable Jerry Akandu. Standing up and talking about a pipeline from one of the, the rivers in Zaire there, everybody knew, engineers knew when Yoma was speaking that river project to push water with pipeline. But those engineers would be told, no, correct it. Don't humiliate the old man. Jerry comes with that idea again last night. The water pipeline from Congo there and so on and so on. And we were saying, but you have the ocean here. <laughs> you, you, you have the ocean here. Desalinate. Why do you need a pipeline for thousands upon thousands upon thousands of kilometers from Congo to bring water to a block in Omaheke. Well, you can just desalinate here. If you were Botswana, that is landlocked, we could understand. But you have an ocean here. You just take the salt out of the water. It's called desalination, if Jerry doesn't know. And then you proceed to use the water. Cognitive dissonance. You know what you are talking about is rubbish, but you proceed with what is wrong. What kind of leadership is that? What kind of leadership is that? Secondly, we spoke also last night about 
Namibians that have the skills and capacity to be employed in international institutions. In terms of SADC, the Deputy Prime Minister said we have filled the quota of 11. But it's good and well. Many of us know the economist Mie Gaumab. Mie Gaumab worked at the Africa Development Bank and was involved in facilitating also the loan for Namibia that came uh, a couple of billions to assess this country a couple of years back. Mie Gaumab is now on the street. A technical expert that can be anything from being Minister of Finance, to being the governor of the Bank of Namibia, to being the CEO of one or the other parastatal, they have left him on the street. How? They have this vetting process that will be asking a legal opinion whether it is constitutionally legal. They use a vetting process in which those that have the skills but are not politically wanted are completely sidelined simply because they failed the vetting process. Tell me, how will Mie Gauma be a threat to national security? That he has, of all people, having worked at the Africa Development Bank, suddenly comes and fails a vetting test in his home country and therefore cannot be employed. If somebody meets 80% of the requirements, that's an A-plus student. Now vetting is brought in so that you bring in an equation in the balance of facts that you control. Because you can't control his capacity. He's too good. You bring him to an interview, he will succeed. You give him a task, he will succeed. That you can't control. You need to bring in something that you control. You bring in a vetting so that you push him off. This is precisely what they did with the vetting at the procurement board of Namibia. I was informed by an inside source that even cleaners, cleaners, people who clean, sweep from the south and the western part of the country <laughs> fail a vetting test. Cleaner, you, 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 you make tea, you take water in a bath, you wash windows, and, and, and so you are a threat to national security. You fail vetting so that you are sorted out. This is the same government at the, at, at, at the left hand that speaks about let's be together. And on the right hand side does this type of thing to eliminate other ethnic groups that they don't want. Very sad, a cleaner fails vetting. Anybody, and this is common practice, unless somebody retires, anybody who is successful in a foreign mission and returns home, normally, normally gets to be given a strategic assignment in their home country. It's normal. Particularly when your mission was successful, Mie Gaumab assisted in facilitating a loan for this country. They received the money. They spent the money. When he comes back, he is a threat to national security. And we're going to meet Mie and talk about this matter really with him. Uh, because it's, it's really sad. Of course, we must understand that Ipumbu Shimi is a protege of Sarah. It's the same clique, and that they would do the same things as the previous ones have done should not be a surprise. Finally, what have we seen from inside parliament? First, we, we must say the president was sweating quite a lot, I must say, he was sweating quite a lot the other day when he was in parliament. He was sweating a lot uh, because of the heat of the moment, you know. Secondly, 
you could see that the team that he has is not unified behind him. They were quiet the entire time. We are told he was scolding them. They were quiet. The whole state of the nation. Why? We are told because they didn't want Peter Kachivivi to be the speaker. They wanted someone else. John Mutora were told to be the speaker. So they decided that let him be protected by his candidate for speaker position. But the president's statement, as leader Sebeb also said, was really empty of anything promising and hopeful. Failed to inspire hope, failed to create new opportunities, failed to create a vision of how they will get us out of this economic crisis. Nothing. No clear plan, no clear vision, no clear activity as to how they will cut spending and so on. And we say, if you have budgeted 174 million for a Ministry of Trade, if you have budgeted 187 for a Ministry of Employment Creation, just close these things. It's a joke. It's a joke. Those amounts are for salaries. Close these ministries, put them in departments, let them pack up and go, and you then incorporate them in another structure of government, maybe in planning commission. There's nothing that ministry, ministers can... Who has industrialized a country with 174 million? Who has done it? You can't even start an irrigation project of, of 500 hectares worth 174 million. So the present state of the nation was really empty of anything substantive, couldn't inspire Namibians, it couldn't give us a direction of where this president wants to take this country forward. Secondly, it was not ideologically connected to the principal issues that we think should have been addressed. All Asian countries, except Hong Kong and Singapore, developed by strengthening agriculture, creating immediate jobs, creating service sectors, and created an agro-industrial framework through which they then uh, modernized the secondary sector. So you build from the primary sector, strengthen the primary sector, expand opportunities in the primary sector, and from the primary sector, you construct a stronger secondary sector. Our primary sector is not growing. There are no plans to grow the primary sector, and therefore the secondary sector will not grow. And our records show that the secondary sector has been stagnating at 10% since 1980. 40 year stagnation. So, as we are rounding off, we are saying from a closer proximity, we have seen beyond what we said about the state of the nation a government that is exhausted. Swapo party ministers are exhausted. We have seen them from nearby. We haven't seen them in a long time. We have seen them from close by for the past two weeks. They are exhausted physically and mentally and further intellectually. They are gone. They are gone. Namibians who keep on voting for Swapo, I wish you could sit for two, three days with those that are ministers and see how exhaustion kills these people. They can't answer questions anymore. They run away from questions. They are confused, and so on and so forth. So our experience for the past two weeks has been that it was correct that a political party as LPM has come to the fore, that our analysis about the inability of these people to take the country forward is correct, that we must strengthen our capacity in-house if it is appropriate and that we must continue to be robust is also appropriate. I end again with this matter of disrespect. Who has taken an oath to respect Swapo Party? 
I have not taken an oath to respect Swapo Party and its officials in Parliament. Never. There's nothing in the oath that I hereby pledge to respect Swapo Party and its ministers. There's nothing. Nothing. Yes, of course, in terms of human interaction, you want basic decency. And indeed, that basic decency we have exercised. We have been commending the Prime Minister. We have even given the President commentary on the last part of his State of the Nation. We have even, in the State of the Nation, taken the, the podium to say that we don't hate the President. We pray for the President. Where was Chris Jacobi? But you can see the class alliance, the Trasco alliance with the ruling elite is at work. And we've said it in our statement. The elite and the class alliance with capital is one society. The other society is the working class, the urban disenfranchised, the disempowered, the excluded uh, structurally from the economy. Those two societies exist. So they push this thing of disrespect, but we also know that Informante has been anti-LP. There was a funeral recently in Handys Bay that was attended by three, four governors of SWAPO, CROs of SWAPO, CEOs of SWAPO, but Informante takes a picture of leader Ivan Scraver, puts him in the newspaper and says, he didn't observe social distancing. It was his funeral. He has broken the laws and the regulations and tried to portray this as a, an LPM event. But it's a funeral for Swapo councillor also. The Swapos themselves were angry. Someone inside Informante said, leave it for now. We'll see how it goes. We have to call a Desmond, what is his name? Basson, what is it? Neville Basson. Neville Basson. We have to call him and say, what is it that you are now saying, Neville? Your newspaper has again written nonsense about, about LPM uh, pushing their political agenda. Respect from whom? Who defines respect? Who defines it? Is it the elite that must define what respect looks like? They have stolen from the people. Is that not disrespect? They have mismanaged state resources. Not, that not disrespect. We are still speaking with words. We are speaking with words. So Namibians who are concerned about this matter of disrespect, don't worry about it. In executing our job, we respect you, the people of this country, that have voted for us that have stood up for us when it was cold, it was unfashionable, when you were hungry. You stood with us. And when we go into parliament, we cannot become friendly boys and girls with those that have cost your lives, your children's lives, to be worse than before. When we have to be angry with people, it is for you. When we have to shout at somebody, it is on your behalf for a better life for you. When we have a particular attitude that seems to suggest that we are constantly unhappy with certain things that the government is doing, it is because of our unrelenting solidarity and our indescribable love for you, for your child's future, for your grandchild's future. So forgive us when in this process of fighting for you in the best way we know how, when we also make you worry a little bit about what our strategy is. Our strategy is to be robust, to be direct, to be as clear as possible on the issues that affect you. It is not to disrespect you that has voted for us. Those of you that voted for us, please stay with us. 
continue voting for us. Don't go. This is your home. Stay put. All things that happen are meant to happen. And at the end of the day, you will recognize that our strategies in Parliament are strategies that will bear fruit for you, and if not for you, for your children, and if not for your children, for your grandchildren. Hang in there. Stay strong. Don't be discouraged. Don't be demobilized. Stay together. We have not abandoned you. The alternative that we have to sit in Parliament and to keep quiet is a dangerous alternative. We can go to Parliament and sit and keep quiet and listen to what Swapo says and clap hands for them and you will start to wonder whether we have not been bribed with new Mercedes Benzes, with new houses, with a number of cattle. You who today says we are disrespectful, you will start to wonder what happened. Are they also bought over, you will ask us. But that alternative, we can't follow. I understand that you say, some of you, keep it a little bit cool. But when you are in hot water, tell me which lump will stand still. At the same time, when you are in cold water, tell me which lump will stand still. You have to be kicking and dancing and screaming so that somebody, somewhere, hears your kicks and your cries and therefore society gets to change. Politics that we're introducing in this country is not Malema politics. It is the politics relevant to the time that we live in, relevant to the conditions that we experience. And it is not a politics of the respectful, of the silent, of the decent men and women that say yes and amen, and then say honorable minister, honorable speaker, and they go out and swap up behind the scenes says we have them under control. No, no, no fellow citizen. It is the politics of Swart Boy, the man who looks angry, but who actually smiles a lot. It is the politics of honesty, integrity. It is the politics of the stern man, the stern woman, who looks the enemy in the face, in the eyes, and says, I don't like what you are doing, and I will not allow you to rob others in this country of their rightful share, of their rightful heritage. That is the politics we are about. Not anger, unless it's righteous, not disrespectful, unless they disrespect us, not chaotic, unless they cause chaos, not indecent, unless they are indecent, not of fear, unless they want to show us that they want to intimidate us, in which instance we respond. The reason why SWAPO and its operatives are saying we are disrespectful is for the first time in their political life, we have a party that stands up to swap our party in parliament, not behind the scenes, not in news conferences, but directly, and confront swap our party with their own mishaps and misdoings. On that note, thank you very much, and uh, we are ready for questions, if there are any. But we hope there are no questions. <laughs> As things will okay. Okay. Um, regarding the, the water issue, you mentioned the desalination and the fight in Congo. Uh, in terms of cost, um, and also given the current budget, have you figured out how much this is going to cost? Because um, if you ask NAM, NAM Water, they tell you, oh, the money is this and that. Now, um, have you figured out how much it's going to cost to start desalinating and provide water to a, a particular uh, region? Yeah. No, no, thanks. I, I think um, in terms of um, the cost, clearly it will be more expensive to lay a pipeline from, from Zaire to here. But of course, I know we have been speaking to uh, Elijah Burare, who is now director at, 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 at uh, Ministry of, of Water and, and, and Land and Agri Agriculture, that they have raised some monies to rehabilitate boreholes. I'm speaking of now, 
they are rehabilitating balls. I think he was in Karas Taras yesterday. I think he's probably today in Harta. They are rehabilitating balls and want to commend the government really for rehabilitating balls and so on. Um, so that process is important. But desalination itself is also an expensive process. But comparatively between the two, uh, desalination versus a pipeline from the Congo, clearly desalination uh, is, is, is much more cheaper, but it's also within our own control because it's a resource that is within our economic, uh, exclusive economic zone, pull water from there. It's within our own um, territory and it creates um, a greater water independence than to be dependent from, from another country. And as much as that country is an African country and then we obviously would want to work together. Idea is not to start impossible projects and imagine things that are that are a bit out of the realm. We can desalinate, this is the point we're making, let's desalinate uh, and, and there are also water resources as we speak. You have a huge water resource in combat, underground water resources. Also in the northern part of the country, Oshakati and other areas, you have underground water that you can utilize um, to enhance our water availability and so on. So we, we have not done with the sums, uh, but, but clearly, from the internal reporting that we have, it, it will be much more expensive to, to, to their pipeline. And in terms of a uh, time frame, say um, you you had access to this fund, and obviously it's still in the future, but the FDM gets into power. Um, how long do you think this will take? I mean, some people will be looking at it and think, okay, that's hope now. How long do you think this is going to take? And can it be done? No, you, you know, you can't talk of agrarian reform without water reform. So for us, agriculture and the things we speak of agriculture has to also and includes water reform. And, and when we speak of agrarian reform, we also speak of water reform. And it is simultaneous processes that we speak about. So when we get into office, it will be the types of things that will be day one planning. Uh, how do we desalinate, what are the costs, how many desalination plants do we need, which water uh, 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 hungry areas should we target first and this type of thing. It will be day one issues really that, that will have to be dealt with because you know we are saying jobs and agriculture uh, and jobs in agriculture. Our, our approach really to, to agriculture is to create um, and an agriculture industrial complex in this country. If today you look at South Africa, 20% of, of South Africa's agriculture produces 80% of the food in South Africa. That's how big they have industrialized agriculture in South Africa. While we do not push away and do not certainly propagate to push away small producers in agriculture, which we will never do, we are of the view that you have to industrialize agriculture to absorb greater job opportunities for, for, for unskilled and low-skilled Namibians, but also for skilled Namibians, and to turn the country around into an export oasis of agricultural goods and food. Remember, we have said that only 40% of what we consume is actually produced here. 60% is, 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 is imported. And you speak of per month 170 million plus of imports in in 10 months that's